as opposed to other believers should be, but if you do not walk with God's plan, you do not walk in the protocol of God, the Holy Spirit, and His truth and reality, what kind of light are you? You're not a light. You're not a light of the world. In reality, you have dimmed your own light by choosing not to follow the Lord and His protocol. So, the people who do, those that's called the remnant in Scripture. And what I want to let you know is that we're going to talk about this. This will be more fun on Sunday, but God preserves the pivot. He, prefer, he, he preserves the remnant. And how do we know that? Because we know Daniel, we know Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, we know Ezekiel, we know Jeremiah, well, we know all those, just right off the top of our head and many others, that in reality, when, that, when, when uh, Jerusalem was conquered and Israel was conquered in 586 B.C., God took them out beforehand and preserved them and used them actually to establish the next remnant of the next generation, like Zerubbabel and Joshua, who went in back into the land 70 years later. Um, and another one I had down here is the Northern Kingdom, when it fell in 721 BC, if you remember that was the Ten Tribes, What you find as you read past 721, when the Northern Kingdom is wiped out, and it, by the way, it is never returned. Uh, some people say that it was, it was never returned with the Jews, it was returned with other people, uh, other people that they had in captivity. What the uh, series did is they swapped people. So they, so they did not make it back, the ten tribes didn't get lost, and they didn't get returned. But in 721, what you find out is as you read things in the southern kingdom called Judah, as you read things in there, you find the Lord saying, and all the tribes were there. So the first thing you should be asking yourself, why, how can all the tribes be there in Jerusalem and in Judea when they were wiped out? Well, it's referring to the remnant that God preserved. And what he did with them is he actually had them move into, into, into Israel when the northern kingdom was apostate. I mean, moved to Ju uh, Judah, the lower part, the southern kingdom when they were apostate, and by their fight doing that, God moved them, they were preserved when the northern kingdom was taken into captivity by the Assyrians and wiped out, never to return in 721. Then we have a very similar action happening with Christians in 70 AD when, uh, when Jerusalem and that part of Israel actually got its final uh, fifth cycle of discipline. It was wiped out and removed up until this very day. It's, there is no believing, um, there's no believers in there today except for Christians, but not Jews. There's no temple today. There's no priesthood today. We can keep going. <laughs> okay. But what happened is that if you remember, the Lord told him to move. And so what he did is he actually incited the people like Nero and, and some of the ones before that to to actually persecute the Christians so they would move away from Jerusalem, okay? Because remember, Jerusalem was the, was the center point of Christianity after uh, when, when the Pentecost took place. But what happened is by the persecution, by the Romans, the Christians moved out throughout the empire and thereby got preserved for the, in, in 68 AD, when Vespasian originally started this, followed by his son Titus. In reality, all of them were preserved, and the Jews who stayed there, uh, in reality, over a million of them were, uh, were killed. And many of them starved to death, and the rest of them went into slavery. Okay? So, in reality, God preserved the believers by moving them out. He moved out John. He moved out Peter, if you remember. So, in reality, God's uh, spiritual remnant is preserved for the next generation. And what happens is when that remnant gets really small, the, the darkness happens, degeneracy follows it, evil follows it, and it becomes under discipline by God because of that. Okay? <clears throat> um, so, the next piece here is this, why the discipline and the destruction of God's national representative? Okay? And we're going to cover that on Sunday. It's down here. But I'm going to read you the kind of the, the verse here that kind of gives us the, the hint. And actually it's in um, 
Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, and um, I'm going to read it to you, and then, and then I'll kind of give you the, the summary, okay? And then we'll come up and we'll actually dive deeper into it with the verses that tell us all this on Sunday. It says, um, what is it, 512? It says, in fact, well, let's read 11 too because it kind of makes sense. He says, uh, we have much more to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. That's not a compliment. <laughs> okay? He says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God all over again. Which means that they learn them. Now, many interesting enough is that many Christians have been Christians for decades. Yet they are some of the most immature people. Not just Christians, but immature people that there are around. What does that mean? This is the kind of stuff it's talking about here. He says, although you should be teachers because you've been in church and you've been a believer for so long, in reality you need someone to teach you all those elementary doctrines, the ABC stuff, because you, because you not only drifted away from it as the core teaching the foundation, but in reality you don't even remember it anymore. Okay? He says, um, you need milk. Not food. Now, who do you give milk to? Babies. Okay, that's who you give it to. You, they don't get solid food. And those are really small babies. Okay? Uh, 13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. That means that you can't teach them about righteousness, the righteous life that, that is a Christ-like life. You can't you can't understand that. They don't get it because they don't even know the ABCs. And they're the ones that sit there and say, gee, I sure wish Richard would teach something else. I am so bored. And they don't just do it in my class. They do it in anybody who teaches that truth. They teach righteousness. They teach meat and potatoes. They teach the true word of God and not some little thing that makes you just feel good or encourages, encourages you. And he says... But, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use, uh, constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And that word good is the word by good of intrinsic value. It's truly good. And the evil there, in this case, is dead works. Okay, that's human works. So, so much of, of humanism is being taught in church today. In reality, this is what it does. But note what it says. He says, he says, by those who constantly use to train themselves. That means that you take Bible doctrine, that you learn in the Bible study, and you meditate on it day and night so that you're careful to do everything written in it. That's required. Okay? You don't just sit there and say, that was a good 20 minutes. That was a great motto. We sure enjoyed that. I'm so encouraged. That's not what we do. Okay? We are these people. Okay? So the whole point is that to me is that why are we in trouble? I'll kind of give you the answer. It's because we are a country of baby Christians. Babies. We're a bunch of babies is what we are. Now, that's not true for all. Okay? And then you know who you are and who you're not. Because that definition just told you, but in reality, you want to know what's wrong with this country and why are we in so much trouble? Because Christianity is a baby faith to most of the Christians in this country. The great majority. The great majority. It would be a landslide if it were an election. <laughs> that's a joke, by the way. Never mind. Okay, so that's why, and we'll come back to it, and we'll prove it down here when we talk about it on Sunday, when we talk about that piece. So let's get to the actual lesson. We kind of touched bases with the, um, 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 we just touched bases with verse 10. But in order to understand verse 10, as we learned about it last week, um, it's an apotesis, okay? And you don't have to remember what that word is, but what you do is that what happens with an apotesis and a protesis is a protesis is the first class. It's called a conditional statement. It says, if you do this, then this will happen. 
Okay, now as you know, there's four, uh, four conditional clauses in Greek. One is a, a yes and it's true. One's no and it's not true. Uh, third one is uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And the fourth one is you wish it were true, but it's not. And I've told you the example of that, that Peter gives to them when they're being persecuted. And he says, um, and, and don't you wish you were being persecuted because of the Lord? In reality, you're being persecuted because you're stupid. Okay, that was my summary. <laughs> so this one is a first class. So you have to go back to first verse 9 just to brush it to understand the second half. So we're just going to read uh, verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them. This Remember, there's, there's three of them. And they're the ones who are coming uh, at noontime. And they follow one after the other. One's in evangelism. Uh, the next one's are, are dictates. Okay? And he says, If anyone, that's a category of people, if anyone, and that's first class condition, so it means if and it's true, worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or their hands, that's the first part, if they do this, they too, means yes they will, a drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath, and they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And I'm going to read, I'll read the translation again because it's a little more specific. Okay? It says, He also will drink. And that's talking about the person in verse 9. So the people who worship the beast will also, will, operative word, there will be no choice, it is that if you do the first thing, this will happen to you. It's not a maybe it'll happen to you, or there's a high chance it'll happen to you. It is 100%. It will happen to them. Okay, <clears throat> and the translation says, He will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, concentrated or undiluted, is what it says, um, in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented in fire and burning sulfur before his holy angels and before the Lamb. And this, like we said, this will be the second, uh, second half of the tribulation. And the word here is actually the word for wine, but the wrath part is actually an anthropopathism, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that God's going to get, uh, even though it's, it's violent, it mean, doesn't mean that God is getting angry in the sense that the word orge means anger, but in reality it is not anger like we think about anger. It's not reckless anger. God is never reckless. He is, this is what they call, the reason it's called anthropopathism is because what it does is it gives us God's policy, okay? It means that it's just like the same thing as that when, you, you know, you, you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're, you're saved, but if you don't, then the wrath of God is on you, remains on you, okay? And what it means is that that is, that is the course that God has for them. Is that when they when they worship the beast and they take his mark, in reality they have sealed their future, okay? And what it means that that God can no longer save them because they have taken themselves over the edge of that, okay? Um, it mean it doesn't mean that God. Uh, let me see. What, how's the best way to put it? Because I've messed this up before. The whole point is that it means that God has offered you the only possibility for having, for being saved and living with him forever. And when you choose to ignore it, when you choose to reject it, there is not a second option. God, this is the part we talk about is that there is no plan B for salvation. Every once in a while you'll hear uh, an evangelist bring something up that sounds like there's a plan B. But there's never a plan B. They'll suddenly say, well, what if you never sinned? You know, what if you... Well, the reality is that if you never sinned, you would still go to hell. Okay? Because you have your sin nature, which is the part that condemns you. Okay? The fact that you have the sin nature and you have not transferred your life to being on the side of Christ, you remain on the side of Satan. By definition. Okay? So it's a matter of... And the other part is understanding is that this is a grace function, okay? Uh, to, to me, one of the most interesting things here 
is the fact that it's rejected. <clears throat> so, we say he also will drink. And I want you to know that the word here in the, in the, in the translation says they, in the plural. But in reality, the Greek is singular for every one of these words in this sentence. It says, he will drink of the wine of God's wrath. Undiluted, the full strength. That means without reservation or deviation. All that's there. The full strength of it. The word that's actually full strength isn't actually full strength. It, the word is diluted, undiluted. And what it means, it's an idiom that means full strength. It means that it, it comes from the part of when you, when in the ancient world they had wine, they'd put a little water in it to dilute it. And when you got a little drunker, you didn't know the difference. Well, this means that they didn't do anything to it. It was the full strength of the wine, okay, in this case. So it means the full, um, the full measure of the wrath of God. There is nothing deviating there whatsoever. Um, I believe that without reservation, the reason that it's using a singular is because it is a singular uh, opportunity to be saved. Every individual has the choice. And it tells you that every individual who makes this choice has rejected the offer of Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, and it says, it is poured into the cup of his wrath. Now, the interesting word is cup is another kind of a, uh, I'd say, homorphism, but it's actually propathism. But this is the same cup that we talked about um, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, take this cup from me. If, if, if you can, take this cup from me. Remember, but he says, this cup is the same thing in that the wrath of God was in the cup because that Jesus took to the cross because all the sins that would ever be committed were in that cup. Okay, it's not a real cup. It's a metaphorical cup. Okay, just like this is a metaphorical cup, okay, um, and it's an anthropopathism for, these, for the same reason. Now, to me, what it says, it says, and he will be tormented, and the word, it's a passive word, means that he will, he will receive the torment, okay, he will continuously receive the torment because there is no, uh, it, it, it does not stop, okay. So, if anybody, are, uh, I always like this part here, it sounds, it must be my sixth sense of humor, but I always said there's just people say, well, I don't think there is a hell. Okay, you know something? There's not, only a, there's not only a hell, but it is unimaginable. That's how bad it is. It is unimaginable forever. And it says, they will be, tointed, uh, they will be tormented, they will receive that torment continuously. Okay. Now, it says, in fire, with burning sulfur. And I talked to you a little bit about sulfur. Sulfur is something that when it burns, you can't put it out. Okay? It just continually burns. Okay? Um, and notice, what I want you to know is that notice there's no, there's no word host in here. There's no word like. This is not a metaphor. Okay? This is not a metaphor. There's no like. It'll be burning like sulfur. No, no. It will be exactly like sulfur sulfur, except in a very spiritual way that will last forever. Um, and it says here that, it'll, that this will happen before the angels and before the Lamb. Now I noted here John 1.29, this is the piece that says, when John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It is right that they should be there to see as they are in the baptism of fire, that takes place, that they should see the Lamb that they rejected, that was offered to them in absolute unequivocal grace. This is one of the things that I think is really important because this is the salvation message. People don't get the salvation of grace. Grace means that you can be the biggest stinker in the whole wide world and be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. There's nothing, there's nothing ahead of you. I mean, nothing, nothing preventing you. There's no obstacle. In reality, the gospel is, is the good news because it tells you that there is no obstacle for anyone ever. Okay? God's not going to sit there and say, you know something? No, your sins were a little more, you know, you, 
you, you as bad as Richard, I don't think you're going to make it, you know? It's not like that. In reality, that there are enough sins that a person can do that, that precludes them from the offer because the offer is grace. And grace means no strings attached. It means that there's nothing, there's nothing conditional that that offer is yours to accept. But the problem is, in order to have the offer, you have to have faith to receive that. It's the receiving part. That's where, that's where faith comes in, is that when you, when you, when you uh, receive it, you receive it as an action of non-meritorious faith, which means that you didn't do anything to get it. You didn't have to be good. You didn't have to be smart. You didn't have to be rich. You didn't have to go to church. You don't ever have to go to church. People hate that part, okay? You know something? You can be saved and never go to church again. Never pray again. Never go to Sunday school. Never give any money. And how do we know that? The thief on the cross. That's my favorite student. The thief on the cross. The acid test of all salvation. What did the thief on the cross bring with him to the Lord? Zero. What's the big joke? He didn't raise his hand. <laughs> okay, never mind. He didn't raise his hand. He didn't, he didn't go down the aisle. He didn't, he didn't do anything. He said, one thing to the Lord. Remember me. That's faith. Remember me when you get to your kingdom. And Jesus confirmed it by saying, even this day, you, thief, criminal, will be with me in paradise forever. It takes nothing. It's grace. So that's the offer that they gave. Okay? Now, I want to read this verse right here because this is another piece of the baptism of fire. Hopefully you've had a chance to um, look at the other verses. But this is to explain the part of Jesus and the angels uh, so that you know that they are there. When this happens, when they are there, okay, as, as a result of the baptism of fire, the Lamb of God will be there and the elect angels of God will be there too. So it's Matthew 13, 40-42. And you know the parable, because we've been, uh, you know the parable from before. He says, uh, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, that's the baptism of fire, so it will be at the end of the age. What the end of the age? The end of the age of Israel, the 70th week, the week of the tribulation. Okay, the last part, the second advent. The Son of Man will send out His angels, the elect angels of God, and they will weed out of His kingdom. Where is His kingdom? On the earth. Okay? Everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace. That's the baptism of fire. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Forever and ever and ever. And then 43 also gives the message. Then the righteous will shine. This will be those who remain um, in the kingdom afterwards, after the second advent, uh, like the sun. And then it goes on from there. And then Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It means I gave you doctrine, you listen to it. And he's speaking to who? He's speaking to the Jews. Because this is a Jewish context in the book of Matthew. Okay? So, my whole joke here, and I put this in a little tiny reading so you couldn't read it. So, this is the part I like it when people say, well, dear sweet Jesus, you know, Jesus would never say that. Jesus would never do this. Okay? Sometimes I've been accused of being too sarcastic by many people because sarcasm is a lot of fun. It's a great way of teaching a point. I use it. Jesus used it. Paul used it, it's used continually, but a lot of people don't like it because they think it's nasty. And they don't want me to be, they want us to be like, sweet Jesus. Well, I want you to know that Jesus is the one who executes that judgment, and Jesus is the one who throws them into, by the baptism of fire, that goes into this piece where they have burning sulfur. So if you get sarcasm and it helps you understand the point of the Word of God or somebody gets saved from it, it is much better than the burning sulfur. And yes, Jesus did that. Okay? So, if you're offended by sarcasm, you've got your principles wrong. 
if you think Jesus wouldn't be mean <laughs> to uh, save somebody, then you haven't been paying attention to crisis evangelism, where buildings fall on people and kill them, and they watch all these horrific things happen over and over and over again. Why? Because they have rejected Christ, because they are stubborn necks, stiff neck people, but God will do whatever it takes for them to be saved. And he knows exactly what that is. Some people have to lose everything to come to him. Everything. This is true in maturity too. Many times God takes things from you that you love so much that you put before him. And he will not tolerate it. He loves you too much for you to do that. To you and those ones you love. So. My little notes are here, so I'm losing. Verse 11. He says, In the smoke, this is the contact, concept, this is after the baptism of fire. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and there will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, and for anyone, same, we had two verses ago, who receives the mark of its name. And it's talking specifically about those believers. It, it started with it in verse 9 to let us know what it was. It ends it here and, and seams it up for us. So that there's no um, misunderstanding the consequences of this choice. The Greek part here, another translation says, Then the smoke of their torment keeps rising Forever and forever. So what is the smoke of this thing? Smoke is, if you have to understand the, the, the metaphors being used here, the, the smoke is incomplete burning. When you burn something but don't consume it, it smokes. That's what happens. It's called incomplete burning. It means that you have the ability to burn it, but you don't consume it as you're burning it. So in reality, this torment is being burned forever and ever. And the sign of it is the smoke. In reality, it does not consume it and go out. That's the point. That's the point, the point of that smoke. And it says it keeps rising forever and ever. And those are the two words there. The Greek words are forever and ever. Never stopping, always continuously, day and night for all eternity. Sounds harsh, huh? Yet the Word of God tells us it is absolutely just and righteous, and demanded by God as God to have that consequence for those who reject him, just like Satan did. It says, and furthermore, um, they do not have rest day or night for those who worship the dictator, the beast, and his image, and if anyone receives the mark, same, same, uh, same wording here. Now, what is interesting about this piece right here is that this helps us understand the greatest fear of the atheist is that he will not be extinguished. Okay? Their hope, their, all of their hope is that life will, life will just end. I'll just disappear. And they can live with that. And that's why they are so vehemently rejecting this. Because the Word of God says that will not happen. And we have to understand that the, that the true reality is that when God creates a soul and creates a being like, like he did angels, a conscious being, a, 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 a being with volition like people, in reality that person, that being, will never, ever die. They'll go through physical death, but the soul, who is the actual essence of who we are, will live forever. And the question is where that forever will be. Will that forever be here? Okay, hell, Hades, lake of fire, ultimately? Or will it be in heaven? And that's the choice. That's the only choice. So in reality, it helps us keep that perspective, is that this forever and ever is not death like going away. This is not like, like your soul no longer exists. That is the greatest desire of unbelievers, is that nothing will happen. I'll just disappear. But the Word of God says that will not happen. Um, the other part is that this is actually in the perfective present, this, this word torment, 
is in perfecto, which means that it is a completed action uh, that, it, that it happens and doesn't go away. Remember the, the, the perfect is the one where it happens, it's happening now, and it happens forever. That's what that means, it's completed action. Um, I bring us only to the verse here um, and to remind us that for us, this is, this is the contrast here, because for us, we are free to make a decision until the moment of our death. But they will not be like that. They are free to make that decision until the second advent takes place, and then that decision is made for them. Just like that. Baptism of fire just sweeps through, and that's it. The unbelievers will not have time to consider, and whatever age they are, that is the end of their life. There's a verse here I brought up, so if I put it up here, <clears throat> right here, um, forever and ever and ever, no death, conscious, never ending, those are my points. Um, there's a verse here, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, and I want to read it because it's, it's an important verse, um, and it's a, if you're ever evangelizing, evangelizing somebody, this is the verse you want to bring to them. Um... And it says, it's actually a quotation from Isaiah. He says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of, of salvation I helped you. What it means is that, um, well, I'll read the rest of it, it tells you here. It says, uh, I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You make a decision now. That's what you do. You make a decision now. Same with mature, spiritual maturity. You don't wait. Because there may not be a wait. You make the decision now to have eternal consequences. Okay? And then this part right here, I like this part here, because this is, this is you know, um, so many things in the church is trying to be so, um, what do they call it? Seeker friendly. That's what they call it. Okay? Um, God is not seeker-friendly, meaning that his, his laws and his rules and his principles are absolute. They are undeviating. And that's what this is, okay? They will not rest day or night. That's an undeviating sentence. It means that, no, there is no end to this in reality, the consequences of this. And then it repeats the part of who this applies to, okay? Um, when I read this thing, I wrote myself a little, a little note. This must be where the, where the um, you know, the joke comes from, no rest for the wicked. <laughs> and then never mind. It's just my sixth sense of humor. So let's go to verse 12. And this is for the believer. So we've finished this piece here, and now we're going to switch to the believer. Why do we switch to the believer? It's because what they are going to have, the, the test that they have... These people aren't babies, okay? They're not babies. They don't have time to be babies. Even though they will be new to the faith, they will have a very specific amount of time. The world will be absolutely insane from all of our measures of it. Yet, they will be called to be faithful to the end, to death. He says, this calls for patient endurance on the part of God's people who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Let me read it, I think it's a better translation, because the word, uh, the word for command actually isn't, it, you can use it for command, also you use it for, for the word commandments. Um, um, but the word would be better translated here, would be mandates. Okay? For those who keep his mandates. Okay? and remain faithful. And faithful here is what you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a doctrine. It's the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Okay? So it says, uh, this takes courage of the saints. And this is the part I was telling you about before. before. This is faith in Christ, faith in God, but it is courage towards man. Because man is going to be the one who's executing this. In reality, not just the Antichrist, but all those who surround him, who are the, the faithful ones to the ecumenical religion. He says, and the saints 
who observe the mandates of God, fulfill the mandates of God and the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Uh, these are the tribulational uh, saints that we're talking about here, although those same things apply to us. And in reality, um, what we have here is that to observe the mandates of God, I'm bringing this to Romans 12, 21, but I want to remind you of the four mandates that are our protocol because they're the same thing. The mandates of our protocol, there's four of them. Remember, there, I told you them before. They're do, do, don't, don't. That's how you remember them. What is one of the mandates? Do, do walk in the truth. Bible doctrine. Live your life according to how God has instructed us and the protocol he has given us to walk this life with him. Next do. Do walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16. So I say walk in the Spirit so that you do not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Which means that when you sin, confess it, get back on. And do not quench the Holy Spirit is the fourth don't. Is the, is, the, is the second don't of the four mandates that we have. They will have very similar ones, but not like ours. So let's read Romans 12, 21 for a second. Let me see, where are those little tiny words? He says, and this, is, this is a policy, okay? This is a policy. And you're familiar with this verse. He says, do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now what that really says is that don't become, don't be overcome by evil thinking, worldly thinking, humanistic thinking, okay? But overcome evil by good. Good what? The good of God, the intrinsic of God. Many times it is our desire, and we see it now. We see it now in our country where you see Christians who are actually kind of almost revolutionary because they don't like what the left is doing. And I understand this frustrating, but the battle belongs to the Lord, and our job is to overcome evil with good, not with evil. We don't, we're not fighting a flesh and blood war like we've talked about. It's not flesh and blood. This is a spiritual war, and we fight it with spiritual things. We, we fight it with doctrine. We fight it with walking in the Spirit. We, we fight it with walking in the truth. That's what we fight it with. That's the command that they have. This is what they're telling them. Is that You know something? You could try to fight back, but leave it in the Lord's hand. Fight the good fight. Fight it with God. Let God revenge your death. Okay? And it's telling here is that to be confident in God, to have courage towards man, to use faith rest. You're familiar with that. Faith rest is using the rationales of God. It's like if you think for a minute that where you're at today and on a bad day God didn't know, then you're a fool and you've forgotten your doctrine because God is omniscient. God always knows where we're at. He's never dropped us. We have the mind of Christ. Okay? We know that from 1 Corinthians 2.16. We have the mind of Christ. That means we have it available to us. But in this context, who has the mind of Christ? The pneumatikos man, remember? <coughs> the spiritual man. The remnant. You wonder why the rest of Christianity is going around much, like a bunch of squirrels? It's because they do not possess the mind of Christ. They are the ones who have forgotten the ABCs of Christianity. See these little do, do, don't, don't? That's, that's the ABCs. That's the simple protocol of God. Many people haven't even been taught it, but you've been taught it, and you should execute it. Okay. Uh, and keep the faith. Keep the doctrines of Jesus. That's this piece here. Remember the rationales. Okay? Remember the essence of God rationale. That's the part is that you know that whatever happens, that God is his essence. And his essence is effective at all times. He can never lie. He can never be unfaithful. He is infinitely powerful. 
We don't fall out of his plan ever. Okay? Let's go to verse 13. There's actually a lot more to this, but we're, I think we're going to be just fine with it. He says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this. <clears throat> Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Let me see. I wanted to check a word while I'm, while I'm looking. I should check this earlier. Um, yeah, good. Um, and it says, Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labors, for in their deeds will, will follow them, for their deeds will follow them. Another translation says, Then I heard the voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed, blessed are the dead. Now, blessed, we know, is actually in the plural. It means happinesses. Okay? Now, I suspect you haven't thought about that, but for these people, happinesses will be in death. Death, death surrounds them. This is one, a third of the earth, of the people of the earth are wiped out, remember? And then another fourth are wiped out. Well, actually, I think it's a fourth and another third on top of that. The tribulational believers will live where death is prominent everywhere. Okay? He says, who die in the Lord. Um, yes, the Spirit says, from now on, in order that they may have rest from their labors. That means uh, their godly deeds. Uh, and for their accomplishment uh, will follow them forever. This is a great, great verse. I have a whole bunch of verses next to this thing. We're not going to read many of them. But I want to talk about it because in reality what this is saying here it says uh, the, the voice he hears from heaven, that's easy to decide who that is. It, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay? How, how do we know that? It's because the Holy Spirit is the writer of Scripture. We know that from, I got the verses all written down here. Yeah, Hebrews 3, 7, Hebrews 4, 12, goes on and on. Um, and he says, write this, bless, blessings are the dead. Okay? Blessing are the dead. Um, and this is a great time to talk about death in that, uh, you know, for people who believe, and especially for the mature, the happiest moment of your life will be when you die. Okay? Uh, I know you don't think that's true, but that is true. For those who are mature, it is a point where you realize that the infinite blessings and rewards that God has for those who are mature will be on that next second. And you will see your Savior face to face and know that you have lived that life because He will say to you, wonderful job good and faithful servant. Okay? So that's what death. And that's the death that they have. Happinesses will follow that. And it says, who die in Christ. It actually doesn't say Christ, but I brought it up for, for a reason. It actually says Lord. It uses the word kurios, not Jesus. Um, and that's important because this is not positional truth. Okay? Christians are in, are in what's called positional truth. We are in Christ. Okay, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. But we are the only people, Christians are the only people in all of time, forward and backwards, who will ever be in Christ. So that's why it uses the word in the Lord. It is not in the Christ, which would indicate positional truth. And this for them means that they are in God's perfect plan, they are in the Lord's perfect plan, and they are in His perfect timing. As we all are, when we walk with the Lord. Okay? And it says, uh, Yes, says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, from here forward. Here forward where? Death forward. Okay? Life after death. This is the guarantee that is there. That it doesn't happen for them. They live not fun lives for this time. And all their wonderful parts happen afterwards. And that's what the Lord's guaranteeing them. This is the part that they, when they are there, will, will focus and memorize this verse. Because this verse is their promise. This is their promise. Is that on the other side of all the horrific things that are happening, that they will have blessings beyond compare. And that's the part that they will have confidence in God.
to execute. Okay? And no fear, but have courage towards the Antichrist, demonism, and what it executes on them. Okay? Um, that they may rest. And this is in the passive. So it tells us they're going to receive this rest. Who are they going to receive it? From God. Okay? And it's talking about physical death will be that part. And they will have interim bodies between their physical death and the resurrection bodies. That they will be on R&R, &R, rest and relaxation, in case you didn't know what that meant. And they will have that rest, and they will be happier than they have ever been, no matter what. Okay? Um, and it says, from their labors, and this, this uses the word labor, in reality it doesn't use the ergons, um, and it means hard labor. Their labor is going to be hard. If you think that you have it tough as a Christian, you haven't seen anything. Okay? Now, we do have a lot against us in reality that the devil's world is in completely control, and you'll probably notice that more today than any other time, but it's very true. Uh, but they will, they will rest from their labor, from their very hard labor. And it says, and their deeds, and these are talking about godly deeds, their accomplishments, will follow them into eternity. That's a promise. They will, their rewards will follow them. This is the part that we all... This is why you live a moment-to-moment -moment life. Not just because you love your Lord, but because the Lord is promising us these great rewards forever and ever and ever because we are His faithful ones. That is why you do it. That's what you remind yourself of. And the, the, the thing about that is that God wants us to have those rewards and sometimes you'll see people try to say, well, I don't do it for the rewards. Well, then you know something? Then I think you're second-guessing God. Because God has those rewards for us, for that purpose. And they are mentioned everywhere in the scriptures. So on that, we'll end class. There's lots of other verses we could have done. I don't think I had any more verses um, that I wanted to share. Actually, I have a bunch of them. but um, So we'll, we'll, we'll end there. 11 minutes early, my goodness. I'm really going to get it tonight. But um, we'll go to, this is the right demarcation for the next verse because we actually change into something else. Got through four verses. Let's pray and we'll close it for the evening. We will have a Zoom meeting afterwards for those of you who just want to say hi, ask questions, um, see, see our smiling faces so we can see yours. So let's pray. And um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for you showing not just, not just to us about our time, but to the future time, to these future believers who aren't Christians, yet your promises are sure to them. In the most tragic time, you've promised them that their rewards will follow them, that they will have that rest, even though they have a very tough life to live. We pray, Lord, to help us to remember that too, that we know that other faithful believers will be holding on to this every word of doctrine given by the Lord for them to hold on to, to have courage towards the atrocities they see happening in their time. We pray for that exact same courage as we look around us and we see things that are wrong, things that are evil, but we trust in you as the controller and most powerful being that there is, that you have it handled and that nobody can take that from you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, who kept that promise perfectly. Amen.